Thank you for joining us. This is Pastor Mark Biltz coming to you from El Shaddai Ministries. Be blessed and shalom. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your word, your Torah. And I pray, Lord, that uh, tonight we would have open ears and open hearts and open eyes. And even as we're learning your language, the heavenly language, Hebrew, Father, I pray that you would make everyone of quick understanding that they would be able to pick this up. Father, they could truly jump into your word and have a greater understanding. And we just ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay, <clears throat> I'm really excited about tonight and what we'll be teaching. What we're going to be talking tonight is about connecting the covenants. And that is so significant. Let's start with Romans chapter 9, verse 3 through 5 on your notes. Here, Rabbi Shaul is saying, For I could wish that I myself <clears throat> were accursed from Messiah for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. So who's he talking about? The Jews, okay, who are Israelites. Now look what this says. This says concerning the Jews, concerning the Israelites, to them pertain the adoption. Isn't that interesting? Even the Jews need to be adopted just like we're grafted in or adopted. In one sense, they also need to be adopted into the heavenly kingdom. But to them pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the Torah, the service of God, and the promises. So who do all the promises belong to? Israel, the Jews. Okay, but we get to partake. It says, of whom are the fathers and from whom, <clears throat> according to the flesh... Messiah came. Guess what? Messiah is Jewish. Who is overall the eternally blessed God. Amen. Now, how many of us want to be in a close relationship with God? I think all of us don't want to be distant. We want a close relationship. So we need to understand that relationships with God are always based on covenant. If you want to enter a relationship with God, then you need to be in covenant with him. So <clears throat> what we're going to do is look at the Torah in a lot of different ways. But right now we're going to look at the Torah as a covenant. We're going to look at the historical backdrop of covenants. We're going to look at the connection of the biblical covenants. Also, as they relate to other ancient covenants that are outside of the Bible that they had back then. And then we're going to look at the connection in establishing our own biblical foundations. Now here's this book that I don't think was on the book list. It may have been added later, but it's called Take Hold. And it's called Embracing Our Divine Inheritance with Israel. And it's an incredible book. I highly recommend it. And again, you can get it online on eBay or Amazon.com pretty inexpensively. But they have the first chapter is on the covenants. And they define covenants as a legally binding relationship. In this case, it'd be a legally binding divine relationship. And I'm going to go into that more, but I'm just going to read a couple of phrases out of this book and what it has to say about covenants. How many of you ever heard the term cut covenant? You cut covenant. Okay, well, the practice of cutting up an animal was the basis of the common Hebrew expression to cut covenant. That's what they do. They would cut up an animal. They would walk between the parts. And we're going to look at that here in a little bit. But um, let's see. I think this was interesting. They make the comment that not only did the Torah covenant define and amplify the promises, but it served to protect and to secure the promise. Okay, the Torah defined the promise, but it also helped protect it. The Torah was not the promise. Did you get that? The Torah was not the promise. It establishes the conditions under which the terms of the promise could be maintained. The Torah, now listen to this, the Torah could never impart life to sinful man. The Torah, rather, is life for those who already are alive in God. One can only become alive in God through faith. <clears throat> and then he says this, The covenant with Moses, as we have already stated, was not one through which a person could begin a relationship with God. It was rather a covenant wherein the believer enjoyed his relationship with God through his obedience. Let's see. 
there's just uh, a lot of things that were in here that I thought was really good. But anyway, this is the book, uh, and I really recommend reading it, called Take Hold. Now what we want to do is we're going to look at some different things tonight. One of them is the need to study covenants. Why, do we even, why are we here? Why are we even studying the, the word covenant? Well, I'm going to give you at least three reasons that there's a great need for the body of Messiah to grasp the concept of covenant. And the first reason is this, the importance of it in Scripture. I mean, the Scripture is just full of covenants. That's what it's all about. Covenants are deeply embedded within the text and the fabric of the Bible. Secondly, we need to study covenants because of the limited use of the term today. We tend to minimize its significance due to our lack of knowledge. Whenever we don't know about something, what do we do? We minimize it. Or, worse, we import our own cultural misunderstandings of the word into the text. And I believe that's happened a lot. Thirdly, there also is a real lack of covenants in our Western society. Basically, the only covenant people usually think of is a marriage covenant. Okay, but even that and its concept is being destroyed due to the widespread ignorance of covenant relationships. Look what's happened to the marriage covenant today. They want to just do away with marriage altogether because people don't understand covenants because in our society we're not used to making covenants, so having a covenant relationship. <clears throat> so to summarize, if we say we have a relationship with God, it is incumbent upon us to know what a covenant relationship is and how it functions so we can more effectively live in that relationship. So here's something that I want to show you. We're going to start with this first PowerPoint. Put this up here. Anyone know? I'm sorry there's no vowel points here. But does anyone know what that word is? Brashit. And what does brashit mean? In the beginning. This is the first word of your Bible. Genesis 1.1, this is the very first word, brashit. So from the very beginning, what I want to show you, if you'll notice... You have the bait, the resh, the yod, and the tab, which is the word brit, which is the Hebrew word for covenant. So right here, in the very beginning, from the very beginning, you see the word covenant in the very first word. So in the very beginning, God wanted to cut covenant with man. And remember, we defined the word covenant as a legally binding relationship between two or more people. When a husband and a wife get married, it's a legally binding relationship. They're legally bound. That's why you have to go through the trouble of getting lawyers for a divorce, because it's a legally binding relationship. So when we enter a relationship with God, we are entering a binding relationship. Okay? Now here's the amazing thing. Think of this word, a binding relationship. Right here, if you remember, what is, this is the bait resh. What is that word by itself? Bar. And what does bar mean in Hebrew? Son, like bar mitzvah. So here you have the son. The yud in Hebrew, what, does, what picture does the yud represent? What is the yod? A hand. And what is the tav? It was a cross. It means covenant. So here you have the son's hand attached to the cross. So here you have Brit is covenant, and there is a binding relationship where Messiah himself entered his covenant to be with us. Here you have the son's hand bound to the cross. Right there. I mean, this is an incredible way of looking at the word covenant. <clears throat> so now, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the covenants in the ancient Near East. Okay, and we're talking about 2000 B.C. or 3000 B.C. I mean, Moses, and just to give you a quick timeline, uh, David is like 1000 B.C. Moses is 1500 B.C. Abraham is 2000 B.C. Okay, so we're going to be looking at some covenants around the time of Abraham or earlier. And this is before the Moses was ever on the scene. But it's good to compare some of the covenants in the ancient Near East were between two people, just like a husband and a wife. But let's look at some examples in the Torah. In Genesis chapter 31, verse 43 through 46, we see two individuals cutting covenant, and it's Laban and Jacob. 
Here we see Laban answered and said to Jacob, These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and this flock is my flock. All that you see is mine, mine, mine. But what can I do this day to these my daughters or to their children whom they have born? Now therefore come, let us make a covenant. You and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. Then Jacob said to his brethren, gather stones. And they took stones, they made a heap, and ate there on the heap. So what they do? They sacrificed some animals, they built some stones, and they ate there. They cut covenant. This is the whole concept of business meetings over lunch. <laughs> what do you do? You take an animal, you kill it, you throw it on the table, and you guys eat it. Okay? This is relationships are built over meals. That's why we have meals and we have people over and different things like this. <clears throat> but not only were there covenants between people, we see there were covenants between tribes. And why would there be a covenant between tribes? Well, there's a need for mutual protection against a common enemy. Let's say two, there's two tribes, <clears throat> let's say they're equal in power and size, but they need protection from a bigger tribe that's maybe going to come and whoop up on them. So what do they do? They enter a covenant between tribes. We see this in Genesis 14 and verse 12 through 14. Here it says how they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and all of his goods, and they departed. And the one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Aner. And they were allies with Abram. <clears throat> do you know the word allies there in Hebrew is Brit? which means they were in covenant with Abram. And it says, Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. But so here we see Abram. His tribe was in covenant with some other tribes. We also see there's covenant between nations. Well, there's a need for protection between uh, equals or unequals. And we see that with different treaties. Uh, you ever heard of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization? This is a whole group of nations that are coming together in covenant to protect each other from a common or perceived enemy. They have what's called a suzerain treaty. And I think the word is in your notes. It's S-U-Z-E-R-A-I-N. And what a suzerain treaty was, it was where one nation controls another in their international affairs but allows it to have domestic sovereignty. So in other words, there may be one that's a little bit bigger than the other one. Maybe it's an unequal covenant, just like America <clears throat> going into covenant with uh, you know, some little country, Ireland. Okay, So here we have a bigger country cutting covenant with a smaller country. Uh, now, obviously, we don't do what the Suzerain Treaty does, but you know, they're, uh, back in this day, they would uh, see this is the reason why a lot of the Jews preferred Egypt to rule them over Babylon because Egypt allowed them freedom of worship basically they didn't care but see Babylon wanted to control their worship and so see a suzerain treaty is where one country is bigger than the other country and they allow them to have freedom in their domestic affairs but they're going to control the international affairs uh, it usually pays tribute to the sovereign nation, uh, just like, you know, when Rome took over Israel, they, you know, the Caesars, and they had to pay tribute to Caesar. <clears throat> uh, now, in Deuteronomy, we have the case of the great king who enters one with his vassal people, Israel. So here, the Torah it consists of a covenant between the great God, who's the king of the universe, and he's going to enter covenant with little Israel and he says, basically, I'll protect you if you obey me. Let's look at Deuteronomy 7.12. It says, wherefore, it'll come to pass if, if you hearken to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep unto you the covenant and the mercy which he swore unto your fathers. And here were some of the covenant principles. One of the covenant principles uh, that we want to talk about is there had to be mutuality and fidelity. They were the overriding principles. You had to be faithful to the covenant. Without fidelity, covenants would be what? Ineffective. What good is it if entering a covenant if you're not faithful to the, the covenant? And what, when you think of this also, they were obligated upon the next government. For example, 
if America signs a covenant with another country, four years later when the new president comes in, is he still bound to the previous covenant? Yes. Okay, which is kind of interesting when it comes to Torah, how it passes on, we're still bound to that. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the covenant features. Some of the features of these ancient treaties was there had to be a common understanding. There was almost always a religious element. There was almost always covenantal signs. And the terms had to be understood. And one of the common terms, believe it or not, even in the ancient treaties of 4,000 years ago, was the word love. Now, how many of you know in English the word love isn't the best word? I mean, I love my wife and I love hot dogs. Hopefully there's a different level of love there. Okay, so the word love is not the, the best English term. But for our sake, uh, this idea even occurs in secular treaties where a vassal is called upon to love his suzerain. Uh, whatever the relationship was between non-covenantal parties, there would be something different between covenantal parties. In other words, if this great nation is taking on this vassal nation, and he tells the vassal nation that you have to love this nation, that great nation is saying, I'm entering a special relationship with you that I don't have with these other people who aren't in covenant. Just like with our treaties. Evidently, we're supposed to love and protect these countries that are in covenant. Not that we're mean to the people who aren't in covenant with us, you know, the other countries. But it's just whatever you enter covenant that says the relationship with you is a little different. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. It says, so then as we have the chance, let us, what? Is it think good or feel good? It's not let us think good. It's not let us feel good. It's let us do good to everybody, but especially to those who are the family of faith. Okay, the ones that we need to be nice to everybody, but those who are in covenant with, we have to really especially be nice to. Love was not some nebulous emotion or feeling love was always expressed with deeds that were beneficial to the relationship well that's a heavy statement love was not uh, just saying i love you man it wasn't just feelings love was always expressed through deeds that were beneficial to the relationship messiah's death and resurrection were outward expressions of his love our love to him is expressed by what our faithfulness to living out his commandments in covenantal faithfulness. Look at Deuteronomy chapter four, verse uh, chapter six. I mean, verse four through six. You're very familiar with this, but I really want to point something out here. I mean, what's the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God. And what's the next one? Love your neighbor as yourself. Look at Deuteronomy six. Hear, O Israel, which literally means hear and do, not just hear. He says, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God. Now, if they had stopped right there, see, this, this is why we need Torah. Torah defines love. Without Torah, you can't define love because you can have someone, look at these stalkers that stalk Hollywood stars. They say they love them. Well, do they love them? No, they don't love them. Okay, so this is why we have to have Torah because Torah defines what love is. It's not just a feeling. It says here, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your what? That means what you're doing. You have to love them here. You got to love them here. And you got to love them with your actions. It says, and these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. One of the other common terms uh, besides love was loyalty or mercy. And the interesting thing is the Hebrew word chesed is uh, translated different ways in English. But that basically is, the, is the, the main word, chesed. But let's look at some of these ways chesed is translated into English. In Psalms chapter 17 and verse 7, it says, Show your marvelous loving kindness. That's the word chesed. You who save those who take refuge by your right hand from their enemies. Now let's look at Genesis 19, 19. 
Behold, now your servant has found grace in your sight, and you have magnified your mercy. That's the word chesed. So here the word chesed is translated as loving kindness, and then now it's translated as mercy. Well, now let's look at Exodus 34, 6. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. And the word goodness there is chesed. So here chesed is goodness, it's loving kindness, it's mercy. So all of this is wrapped up in that one word, chesed. Chesed is a covenantal word. And think about this. God was under no obligation to enter a covenant with man, was he? He did it totally out of goodness and mercy. And chesed implies being faithful to the covenant. Then next, there was always a religious element to these covenants. Almost everything was done in conjunction with the local gods. Okay, So here, animals would be sacrificed both to the gods and for the mutual consumption of the partakers of the covenant. The meal itself was actually a religious act. Whether it be the God of Israel or some other weird God, that's what they would do. <clears throat> a common picture was for an animal to be sacrificed and then all of its parts cut in half. And th think about this. Why did they do that? This symbolized the grave consequences to the party who failed to uphold the agreement. In other words, they would cut this like Laban and Jacob. They would cut this animal up in two and they would both have to walk between these pieces. And what they're saying is, may I be cut in half if I'm not faithful to the covenant. That's what cutting covenant means. You know, it, it's like, this is what's going to happen to me if I don't keep this covenant. When you think about that, and do you remember, we're going to be looking at this here uh, in, right now. Let's just let's go to that. What happens if God fails to meet his obligations? When God enters a covenant with us, remember in just a minute we're going to look at Genesis 15 where God and Abraham, remember Abraham was kind of in a deep slumber and they cut the, the, he had cut these animals in ha, animal in half and then he goes into this deep vision and look at what it says here. Let's just read it. Genesis 15, 8 through 12. And he said, Lord God, how am I going to know that I'm going to inherit this land? And he said to him, Well, take a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all of these and divided them in the midst. He laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And then, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And in verse 17 it says, It came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. Who was the burning lamp that passed between those pieces? It was Yeshua, okay? In other words, Abram, God said, you don't have to walk through the parts. This covenant is all me. That's what he's saying to Abram. Abram, you just go lay down. You go to sleep. But you're going to see me walking through the parts. So God is saying, all of this this cutting of this animal, God says, will happen to me if I don't keep this covenant. Now you can see why replacement theology is blasphemous. You're saying, God, you, you couldn't do it. You couldn't keep covenant. And God was saying, I keep covenant. That's what he was saying. And he says, guess what, Abraham? Guess what, Israel? It's not dependent upon you. It's all on me. Normally, both parties were required to walk through the parts, which means cut covenant. And then the other thing is there was always signs, almost always signs. We see in Genesis 9.13 where God says, I'm going to put my rainbow in the cloud, and it will be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So let's take a moment now and let's look at some biblical covenants. When I, how many covenants can you think of in the Bible that God made? I mean, the reason why I bring this up, most times Christians think of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. That's what they got, Old Testament, New Testament, or Old Covenant, New Covenant. Guys, there was a lot more. Let's look, look at these. Let me put up this next little clip. Here is before the fall. I have this globe up there showing this covenant was for all of the world, not just Israel. That's the purpose of the globe. 
This is before the fall. There was a covenant God made with Adam or mankind in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 1.28, it says God blessed them, and God said to them, Okay, guys, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. I want you to fill the earth and subdue it. I want you to have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then in Genesis 2, verse 15 through 18, it says, Then the Lord God took the man, he put him in the Garden of Eden, to tend it and to keep it. Okay, so he couldn't just sit and lollygag. He had to work. He had to toil. Even in the Garden of Eden, he was required to work and toil and keep the garden looking good. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat it you shall surely die. So here we see the provisions of the covenant. God says, Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to procreate. I want you to have dominion over animals. I don't want you to eat them. I want you to work the garden, and you're not to eat of the tree of good and evil, and the consequence of failing to keep your end of the covenant is you die. And then we see another covenant. Then we see a covenant that was made with Adam afterwards. Okay, so after the fall, what do we see in Genesis 3, verse 14 through 17? Here what the Lord God says to the serpent, Because you've done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field, on your belly you will go, and you will eat dirt all the days of your life. Then he says, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He'll bruise your head, you'll bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I'm going to greatly multiply your sorrows and your conception, and pain you'll bring forth children. Your desire will be for your husband. He'll rule over you. Then to Adam he said, because you've heeded the voice of your wife, and you've eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, curses the ground for your sake, you... In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So here we see the provisions of this covenant. We see curses put upon man, upon the woman, upon the serpent. But we also see the promise of a redeemer in her seed who's going to come. We see the promise of the defeat of the serpent by the seed of the woman. So this is another promise, that another covenant that God made with Adam. Okay, then we go to the next one. Here we have a covenant now with Noah. And the covenant with Noah was also with the whole world, we see in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1 through 7, how God blessed Noah and his sons. And he said to them, just like with Adam and Eve, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. I want you to replenish the earth. And he says, the fear of you and the dread of you will be upon every beast of the earth, upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moves upon the earth and the fishes of the sea. And to your hand they're delivered. So every moving thing that lives shall be food for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But then he says the big but. He says, but, flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, you shall not eat. And surely the, uh, your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast, will I require it, and at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For an image of God made he man, and you are to be fruitful and multiply and bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply. So then we see in verse 8 through 12, God spoke to Noah, to his sons with him, saying, As for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. There's the seed again, okay, because there was a promised seed. So this one didn't get do away with the other covenant. It built on the other covenant. <clears throat> and he says, And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, cattle, beasts of the earth, all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth, thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all flesh be cut off in the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the whole earth. And God said, here's the sign of the covenant that I'll make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. So anyway, here's the provisions of this covenant with Noah that God would never flood the earth. You can eat whatever you want, but don't eat blood. Don't murder. Continue to procreate. And the sign is the rainbow. Now, we all know God keeps covenant. Did the covenant with Noah, is it done away with? No. Matter of fact, look at Isaiah 54, verse 9 and 10. It says, For this is as the waters of Noah to me, just as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you, for the mountains will depart, the hills be removed, but my kindness will not depart from you, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, says the Lord that has mercy on you. And who's he speaking to? The Jews. Okay, so God is saying, look, Jewish people, I've cut covenant with you, and the mountains could depart, the hills be removed, but my covenant will not depart from you. 
And so God keeps covenant. He's faithful. Then we also see, after these covenants, we have a covenant that God made with Abraham. So let's look at the covenant with Abraham. Now here I have the nation of Israel. The same covenant God gave to Abraham was given to his son Isaac, who was given to his son Jacob. This covenant was being passed on with each generation. It wasn't eliminated, but just like a treaty that America makes with another country, the next president administration, the covenant still holds. And with Abraham, what do we see in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 4? Here the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country and from your kindred, from your father's house, to a land that I'm going to show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I'm going to bless you, make your name great. You'll be a blessing. I'll bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Wow. That's power packed, isn't it? <clears throat> but look, here comes that seed again. In Genesis 15, 18, the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto your seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. So we see the, the seed was being, first it was broad to Adam and Eve, and then it got narrowed down to Noah. Then it gets narrowed down to Abraham, and narrowed down to Isaac, and narrowed down to Jacob. And in Genesis 17, uh, verse 1 through 11, here we see when Abraham was 99 years old that the Lord appeared to him. And he said, I'm the Almighty God. Walk before me and be perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and you. <clears throat> I'm going to multiply you exceedingly. So what did Abraham do? He falls on his face. And God talked with him saying, as for me, my covenant is with you. And you will be a father of many nations. Neither shall your name anymore be called Abram, but your name will be Abraham. For father of many nations have I made you. And then just like with Adam and just like with Noah, he says, I'm going to make you exceedingly fruitful. <clears throat> I'm going to make nations of you. Kings will come out of you. I'm going to establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you and their generations for how long of a covenant? Everlasting covenant to be a God to you and to your seed after you. I will give unto you and to your seed after you the land wherein you are a stranger. Now, when you think about it, it the last 2000 years, Israel was out of the land, wasn't it? It wasn't until 1948 they got the land back. Well, if you think about this, if God says he's made covenant with Israel for that land forever, I mean, a lot of people say, I've read this a few weeks ago, a lot of people say the Bible has nothing to do with this. I'm serious. You, I mean, that's what happens. Well, this covenant was made for the land. That's why it's so important. That's why there's all these arguments going on over the land of Israel today. He says, I'm going to give to you and to your seed after you the land wherein you're a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. I will be their God. And God said, Abram, you shall keep my covenant, therefore, you and your seed after you and their generations. And this is my covenant which you are going to keep between me and you and your seed after you. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it will be a token of the covenant between me and you. So here the sign is circumcision. So in this covenant, the provisions are Abraham's given a land, a people, a great blessing to his descendants, and the world, Messiah, would come through him, and the sign of this covenant is circumcision. Okay, so now that brings us to this next covenant. <clears throat> we have the covenant of Moses, and it is even more specifically given to Israel. We see uh, the whole covenant is in Exodus 19 through chapter 24, uh, but also it is specific in Exodus 31, 16 through 18 also. And so I want to quote that. He says, Wherefore the children of Israel will keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. This is the sign between me and the children of Israel for how long? Forever. And forever is a long time. So just like you have the rainbow as a sign, circumcision as a sign. Here you have the Sabbath is the sign that God is in covenant with Israel. This is the covenant that we've entered into. And he says, It's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth. On the seventh day he rested and was refreshed, and he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. So here, what does this covenant do? This covenant establishes the previous covenant made with Abraham. It's designed to enable his descendants to enjoy the promises God made to Abraham in how to live when they're in the pro uh, promised land. And here we see the covenantal sign is the Shabbat. Okay, then we also see a covenant made with David. 
So here we have King David. And again, that's made with Israel. What do we see in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12-16? through 16? Uh, he says that when your days be fulfilled, you shall sleep with your fathers. I will set up your seed. There's that seed again. Who is this promised seed that's through all these covenants? Messiah, Yeshua. He says, I'm going to set up your seed after you, which shall proceed out of your bowels. I will establish his kingdom. He'll build a house for my name. I'll establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father. He'll be my son. It goes on to say, uh, if he commit iniquity, I will chase him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the children of men, but my mercy shall not depart away from him. As I took up from Saul, whom I put away before you, and your house and your kingdom will be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. So here God establishes the covenant with Abraham and Moses to David, assuring David that the Messiah, that promised seed, will be his descendant and will rule over all of his dynasty. So here we've seen a covenant God made before the fall, after the fall, with Noah, with Abraham, with Moses, with David, and now we come to a new covenant. Okay, let's look at the next one. This is the new covenant. And again, this new covenant is made with who? Israel. It's not made with Gentiles. It is made with Israel and with Judah, and this is the new covenant that non-Jews are grafted into. What do we see in Jeremiah 31, verse 31 through 34? God says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Nowhere does it say with Gentiles or non-Jews. This is who the covenant is with. And he says, It's not going to be the same as the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them out by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant that they broke, although I was, what, a husband to them says the Lord. He says, this will be the covenant that I'm going to make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I'm going to put my Torah in their hearts. I'm going to write it in their hearts, in their inward parts, he says. And I will be their God and they'll be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord, for they're all going to know me from the least to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will, what? I'm going to forgive their iniquity. I'll remember their sin no more. So if the church today says, God erased his covenant with Israel, he won't forgive their iniquity, he still remembers their sin, then you're saying God is a liar. In Ezekiel 36, verse 24 through 28, and this is very prophetic here, look what it says. God says, for I will take you from among the heathen, I'm going to gather you out of all the countries, I'm going to bring you into your own land, and then, this is why in 1948 when they came back, they were basically secular atheists. Okay, they were communists. They came from all over. They didn't believe in God. They were Zionists, but they didn't believe in God. But God says, that's how it's going to come. You're going to come there first, and now I'm going to begin to clean you up. So he says, then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you will be clean from all your filthiness, from all your idols. Will I cleanse you? Then he says this, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I'm going to take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you. And what is the purpose of the new covenant? Look at this. The purpose of the new covenant, he says, is to cause you to walk in my statutes, to keep my judgments, and do them. And then you shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers, and you'll be my people, and I will be your God. Now this covenant really, uh, this may be shocking to some, the new covenant is not completely fulfilled yet. Because how many of you know this is not true of the state of Israel yet? And this is who the covenant was with. So the new covenant is in process. It's a work in progress. <clears throat> this, what the new covenant is, it's a continuation of the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the sign this time is the blood of the Messiah. Now, I want to show you a couple of PowerPoints I made. We'll have some fun here. Okay, here's a Torah school, right? The way I want you to think of these covenants that God has, first we have the Garden of Eden, the covenant that was there. And then God comes along and he also has a covenant that he makes with Noah, which is a continuation of the other one. Covenants build on each other, they don't replace each other. So after the covenant of Noah, we have a covenant that God gave to Abraham. Okay, then we have a covenant that God made with Moses. Then we have a covenant God made with David. Then we have the new covenant, okay? 
But here's what happens. If you decide that you want to get rid of the covenant of Moses, what happens? All of a sudden the Davidic covenant falls? The new covenant falls? Everything, you can't go yanking covenants out. Okay, they build upon each other. Here, I want you to think of the covenants kind of like a puzzle. Okay, they, everything fits together. Okay, you can't be, if, it's like the box top of a puzzle. If you don't have the box top, you don't know how things fit together. And so the covenants really are pieced together. If you decided that, uh, let's say for some reason, the covenant with Adam, is it done away with that God made for the promised seed to come? No. How about the covenant with Noah about the rainbow? Was it done away with? No. How about the covenant with Abraham? Is that done away with? No. So why would we think all of a sudden that the Moses is done away with? Okay, these are all covenants that are tied together. They build upon one another. They're, they're connected. Because God cannot break covenant. How many of you know God is faithful? Does God keep covenant? Okay, so God made a covenant, even the covenant of Moses. He's not going to do away with it. Okay, there's going to be new covenants that will build and expand. Okay. <clears throat> now let's take a look at some covenant metaphors for Israel and God. Some people don't realize when they see the Bible, wow, I didn't know the Bible could do that. Okay, well, let, let me give you some real good examples here. Let's look at it in terms of a father and a son. Okay, we need to see the Torah as an instruction book. Okay, God says to Israel, look, I'm, your fa I'm the father, you're my son. And so he says, I want to instruct you. So what does he do? I want you to see the Torah really as an instruction manual where God is trying to train his kids on here's how I want you to behave. This is what I'm like. You know, think of it as an instruction book. One of the most basic covenantal relationships is family. Isn't it? I mean, can you legally go give your kid away or are you legally bound to your kid? Okay, the, there's a covenantal relationship with family. Look at Exodus 4.22. You shall say to Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Hosea 11.1. 1. God says, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and I called my son out of Egypt. So here we see God has entered a relationship like a father and a son to Israel. So God is also telling Israel, I want you to live according to the covenant of Torah, being faithful. So what did God want them faithful to? To his instruction, to Torah. Now think about this. Can you guys legally go tell your neighbor's kid to cut your lawn? If your neighbor kid comes over and cuts your lawn, does that make him part of your family? Okay. Now, do you tell your own kid to cut your lawn? Now, cutting his lawn... Whether he does or not, he's still part of your family, right? Okay, so people don't understand. Torah, people think you have to do good works to be saved or something like that. That's what's legalism. That's absurd. You can't do good works to get into God's family any more than you can cut your neighbor's lawn and he'll make you part of his inheritance. Okay? But if you belong to the family of God, then it's time to get to work. He tells you something to do. So a lot of Christianity doesn't understand works. Works is for people who are entered into the relationship. You don't do your works to enter into it. It's because you've already entered into the relationship that, you, that God wants to put you to work. <clears throat> like Israel, Yeshua was also called out of Egypt, and he was given the title, My Son, and he is referred to as the firstborn. What do we see in Colossians 1.15? He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. And then verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So knowing about the father-son relationship also helps us understand Yeshua. When we, that's how we can get a better understanding of Yeshua and his relationship to the father. Those who believe in Yeshua are the children of God. God had a single plan program and a unified single people of God from the very beginning. The Torah is Daddy's instruction book on how to live as his children. It's kind of like the how-to manual. With all these different covenants, do you think God didn't know these things were going to happen? And he says, 
Oh my goodness, this Abrahamic covenant is all messed up. Let's make up a covenant with Moses. Oh, that one's all messed up. Let's make up a new one with the covenant of David. Oh, that one's all messed up. Let's make another new covenant. No, God knew what was going to happen, and all of these are tied together. Now, here's another way of looking at the Torah. Not only as a father and a son, the whole idea of Torah is God trying to explain to us the kind of relationship he wants to have with us. And the other one is that of a relationship. So this is a ketubah, okay? When two people get married, this is the, the covenant that they make. And what the Bible is, I want you to think of it as God's love letter to you. God says, this is the love letter. This is the, how much I love you. I'm going to do this for you. And will you do this for me? I want to enter into a marriage relationship with you. Uh, in Exodus 19.5, we see where it says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you will be a peculiar treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. That word peculiar treasure means just a very intimate, close relationship. You're so special compared to anybody else. Okay, it's all about you. And then look at Exodus 6, 6 and 7. It says, Wherefore, say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of Egypt. I'm going to rid you out of their bondage. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And then he says, And I will take you to me for a people. Do you ever, did you catch that? I will take you. How many of you heard that in a betrothal? Will you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? Will you take this man? This is a betrothal that he's saying. I will take you. Okay, I want to enter into a marriage relationship with you. And I will be to you a God, and you will know that I am the Lord your God, which brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Do you remember what feast day this is read on every year? This is the Passover. This is the four cups of Passover. So Israel, think about this, here in the Exodus, this is where God entered into a marriage covenant with Israel. What, after he says, I will take you for myself, you'll be my bride, just like he said earlier, I'm married unto you, I'm a husband to you. What does he do? He tells Israel to build the family home, okay, for the times of intimacy. That was Moses' tabernacle, the Mishkan, the dwelling place. So God betrothed them, and then Israel was to build the house that they were to dwell in on earth, and Yeshua is building the one to dwell in in heaven, which will come down to earth. Look at Isaiah 54, verse 5 through 10. Here he says, your maker is what? Your husband. Okay, now think about this. Here, who is he speaking to? When he says, your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and your redeemer, the holy one of... Okay, so who did he marry? Israel. So, in other words, God married into Israel. Now, this was something that came to me the other day as I was mulling over all of this. What do you think, if you have this married couple over here, husband and wife, and let's say this other woman comes in trying to enter an intimate relationship with this man? Bad news, right? So what happens when the church comes in and tells Israel, you're gone and I'm moving in. It's bad news. This replacement theology I want you to see is the church becomes like the adulterous woman trying to get in on this relationship. We're not to replace, we're to join. Okay? Now, Look at Jeremiah 3, 14. He says, Turn, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am what? I am married to you. And I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Again, God had entered a covenant relationship. Okay? And we know God is not an adulterer. He's not going to be running around with another woman. So he's committed to Israel. The Torah is not just a record of divine laws, but a sacred ketubah. He says, I'm married unto you, okay? It's the marriage contract between God and his bride. What will make the relationship a happy and fruitful one is what the tour is all about. He says, I want to be in a relationship with you. I want you to see me as your father. I want you to see me as your groom. I want you to... So he keeps bringing these different relationships. There's a, a book out a long time ago that I read. It was by Charles Finney. 
And I think you can get it online as a free download. But it's called 54 Relationships of Christ to the Christian. And it refers to God as our king. God as our father. God as our judge. God as our brother. God as our redeemer. There's all these relationships that God has to us. The problem is some of us only know him in one or two of the relationships. We don't know him in all these other relationships. So life is about getting to know God intimately in all of his different relationships to us. Some, of them may, some people may know God as the creator, but they don't know him as the savior. Okay? They may know him as the savior, okay? But maybe they lost their father when they were young. They need to know him as their father. Or maybe they lost their brother. They need to know him as their brother. <clears throat> and this just brings me to another topic. Uh, this is why, I don't know how many of you have ever been involved in evangelism, street witnessing. Most of us are terrified of it, okay? Uh, but some of us have. But uh, one of the things that I found as I was involved in evangelism a long time ago, uh, and in one sense I still am, but I also was involved in sales, okay? Outside sales, inside sales, all kinds of sales. W what do you think if you go to Sears and you want to buy a refrigerator, but the salesman who's in there gets a bonus uh, if they sell ovens? So the whole time you're in there looking for a refrigerator, he's trying to sell you an oven. Right? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Well, this is the problem with evangelism. All too often we do more talking than listening. Just like the salesman. What you want to do is find out what that person's need is. Take the time to find out what their need is and then present how God can meet that need. Maybe what they need is a father. Present them as their father. Maybe they don't need a father, they need a brother. Present them as their brother. So the more relationships that you have personally that you can relate to God in, then that enables you to help people when you find out what their need is to show how God can meet that need. And you find it so much easier bringing people to the Messiah when you show them how he can meet their need. You don't try to sell Messiah in a way that they don't need it that way. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, then the next way that I want you to see the Torah, not only it's an instruction book between the father and the son, not only it's a marriage covenant between a husband and wife, we also can see it as a suzerain treaty, okay, between a lord and a servant. And so God also related to Israel, look, I am also your master, you be servant, I'm master. That's another relationship they needed to understand. See, this goes back again to Christianity. If you only see God as merciful, but not as judge, sometimes we just see greasy grace. But then the other time, some people see God as, this, as Thor throwing lightning bolts at the people below, and they don't see him as merciful. So you have to have this balanced view of who God is. That's why the more relationships you understand, the better off you are. <clears throat> and so this was a suzerain treaty, was uh, not between equals, but between a great king and a vassal nation. So God entered into a treaty with them, not as an equal, but to whom Israel owed its entire existence. Uh, he delivered them from bondage to another nation, and he expected loyalty to him for what he had done. Deuteronomy uh, can be compared to one of the ancient suzerain treaties. And so I have here, like, our Constitution, and here they are, and uh, th this is a treaty like that. And then here uh, is an ancient suzerain treaty that they found that basically lists a lot of these things that I was talking about that they had. This is outside of the Bible, but his historical records show that these kind of things were all in the normal treaties. Now here, Deuteronomy can be compared to an ancient suzerainty treaty, and I have here, in a suzerainty treaty, they describe the nature of the king. And in Deuteronomy, you have the Deuteronomy chapter 1, 1 through 5, it describes the nature of God and what he did for them. The acts of the suzerain king, the historical prologue, Deuteronomy 1, 6 through 4, 49, says all the wonderful things God did. Here this explains who God is, what he did. Then there would be the covenant expectations. Well, here in Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 26, 19, is all the covenant expectations of the stipulations. Uh, in a suzerainty treaty, there'd be the consequences of covenantal faithfulness or unfaithfulness. Well, that's what Deuteronomy 27 through uh, 30 is, all the blessings and the curses. Then there would be witnesses to the ratification of the covenant. Well, in Deuteronomy 30:19, he calls heaven and earth to be the witnesses. 
then you have the continuation of the covenant, how it's to proceed to the next generation. And so here you have the succession in Deuteronomy 31, 1 through 8, where he tells Joshua, you're going to have to carry this on. Uh, then there was a place to store in a public renewal of the covenant, where you see the deposit in the Ark of the Covenant, and they would have to read it every seven years in Deuteronomy 31, 9 through 13. So everything that was in those ancient treaties is what the Torah is. So the Torah was also given to them uh, as a national constitution, okay? Just like our constitution. In Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8, look at what it says. He says, Behold, I've taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land that you're going to possess. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which will hear of all these statutes. And they're going to say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who has a God so nigh to them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? What nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all of this Torah, which I set before you this day? But what happens? Christianity says, oh, what horrible judgments, what horrible statutes, what absurd laws. Does that make sense? That doesn't make sense, does it? These are all wonderful things that tell us about the nature and character of God. And so I want you to see Israel sees the government, religious, the religious Jews, obviously not the secular Jew, they see the Torah as their national constitution. Now, how many of you would like to throw out the Constitution of the United States? I mean, most people are fighting to keep it, right? So the Torah is a national constitution. The Torah is also a treaty between the great God of Israel and little Israel nation. The Torah is also their marriage covenant. The Torah is also as a father and a son do the instruction. So when Christianity comes to Israel and say Yeshua threw out the Torah, what is Christians telling Jews? God just divorced you and... Uh, you don't have a relationship with him as your father and is no longer your national constitution. So why don't get it? Why don't you accept Jesus? <laughs> Hello. So I want you to understand why the Jews love Torah, because uh, Abba's our daddy and we're in relationship with him. We're in a marriage relationship with him. This is our constitution. So now can you get a better understanding when Christians say the Torah's done away with why the Jews wonder about what in the world are we talking about? But if we don't understand covenant, then we think that God couldn't keep covenant. That's the other thing. What do you mean God keeps covenant? Of course that God keeps covenant. So that's why I wanted to teach you real quickly on covenants. And it's exactly 8.30, so we finished on time. But anyway, does this help you understand covenants a little bit more? All right, so let's stand. Father, we just thank you so much for your Torah. We thank you so much for the Feast of Hanukkah that's coming where we can rededicate ourselves back to you. That's what Hanukkah is all about, is the dedicating ourselves to you. And we know you keep covenant. So, Father, I just pray right now that you would give all of your kids a safe ride home and bring them back safely Wednesday night. In Yeshua's name, amen. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries dot U.S. Be blessed and shalom.